Good morning, good morning. <coughs> Welcome to Christmas week. It's now Christmas week. This is the time that we all look forward to getting a bunch of presents, right? Uh, maybe I should rethink that. I should rethink. Yes, I know I should rethink that. <laughs> Please take your songbooks and turn to page 104, 104. 104. And if you are able, please stand while we sing, and I hope you have, Joy to the World. Number 104. singing. Brother Jerry, would you open us in prayer this morning, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning, this bright and cloudless day. Father, we thank you for all of us that were able to come out for worship services and the visitors that we have here with us this morning. Amen. Now, Heavenly Father, be with us as we sing praises unto you and be with us during worship service. Bless the pastor as he brings the message and open our hearts as we receive it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is Christmas week, and uh, we are glad to have you all here. This is our main service at New Testament Baptist Church in Safford, Arizona. We just, we're glad to have you all here. We're glad to have all of you out there. Please tell your friends how to tune in. Remember that you can watch this broadcast later on if you want. You can do that. Okay, it is time. It is time for another hymn history. Does anybody here know where and what the country of Moravia is all about? Does anybody know? I see one that knows something about Moravia. I admit I don't know anything about it, but here's, here is our hymn history, okay? Like all Moravians, John Montgomery had a burden for world evangelism. He was the only Moravian pastor in Scotland, but he and his wife felt God's call to be missionaries to the island of Barbados, tearfully placing their six-year-old son James in a Moravian settlement in County Antrim, Ireland. They sailed away. James never saw them again, for they perished in Barbados. Left with nothing, James was enrolled in a school in England. When he didn't do well, he was apprenticed by school authorities to a baker. Baking wasn't for James. He ran away and spent his teenage years drifting from pillar to post, writing poetry and trying his hand at one thing, then another. He eventually settled down in Sheffield, England. In his early 20s, James began working for the local newspaper, the Sheffield Register, and there he found his niche. He loved writing. It was a politically active newspaper, and when its owner had to suddenly flee the country to avoid persecution and imprisonment, James purchased the paper and renamed it the Sheffield Iris. 
His editorials, too, proved unpopular with local officials. On two separate occasions, he was thrown into jail, but he emerged from prison a celebrity and he used his newly acquired fame to promote his favorite issues. Chief among them was the gospel. Despite the loss of his parents, James Montgomery remained devoted to Christ and to the scriptures, and he championed the cause of foreign missions and of the British Bible Society. As the years passed, he became the most respected leader in Sheffield, and his writings were eagerly read by its citizens. Early on Christmas Eve, 1816, James, then age 45, opened his Bible to Luke chapter 2 and was deeply impressed by verse 13. Pondering the story of the heralding angels, he took his pen and started writing. By the end of the day, his new Christmas poem was being read in the pages of his newspaper. It was later set to music and was first sung on Christmas Day, 1821, in a Moravian church in England. The song, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Please turn to page 108. Hymn number 108 in your songbooks. Angels from the Realms of Glory. We can put ourselves there with those shepherds seeing what they saw. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation story now singing shepherds in the fields abiding watching o'er your flocks by night mad with man is now residing yonder shines the infant light come and worship come and worship worship christ the newborn king sages leave your contemplations beam apart. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Oh, good singing. Thank All you for right. that. Very Pastor. good singing. Very quickly, we have some announcements. We want to move forward here uh, this morning. And so um, let me encourage you to look at your bulletin. Um, in the bulletin, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper right after the morning service. And so that's going to happen here in just a few moments. And then um, the midweek service this week has been moved to Wednesday, December 23rd. And so notice the time change as well. We're going to move this in, in basically we're going to uh, combine it with our Bilas Bible study. And so Wednesday night this week at 6.30 p.m. will be the midweek service. And so um, we are looking forward to that. Also, if you're interested in... Uh, the decorations, uh, we've been helping, uh, this year we were able to help the Jones put up. We're going to help them take it down as well. And that is going to happen a week from uh, this Saturday. So it's basically two weeks away. Um, the first Saturday of the year, so it'll be uh, January 2nd. January 2nd is going to be the day. And then we're going to start at 9 o'clock in the morning here at the church. And uh, so if you would like to help us do that, it will not take very long at all to put everything up. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, John is going to come over and take care of some things the day before uh, just because, you know, we'll probably break them or something. So, so uh, um, John is going to take care of that. So we're looking forward to it. I want to read uh, uh, something. Um, we don't normally do this, but this is a testimony. It's Christmas related. And uh, this is a gentleman, excuse me, I think it's a lady by the name of uh, Elia Maurice. Uh, and this is out of a publication called uh, Midnight Call. And um, I once flew back to Germany after an engagement in Australia. I was sitting next to a Chinese woman. I was trying with all my might to make a connection with her. We were going to be on this plane for about 13 hours. 
And an evangelist who goes without speaking for 13 hours goes crazy. Uh, I, I tried until the food came and then wished her bon appetit. And she said something in Chinese that probably meant thank you. Obviously, this is not a lady, Elia, Leah. Apparently, that is a man. Um, but not knowing uh, that exactly. She was, she was glued to her cell phone the entire time. She typed and typed and eventually fell asleep. I was reading my Bible and taking notes when she suddenly jumped up and began to frantically search for her cell phone. But she didn't find it. She looked high and low, turned everything upside down, and switched down the light. Then she gave me a knowing look. I lost all of my confidence. Maybe I had taken the cell phone. She seemed to think so. She called the stewardess, told her that she'd lost her cell phone, and that without it, her work would be meaningless. She got a flashlight. Turned out that the phone was stuck between her seat and the wall. I took a deep breath, thank God, and said in my heart, Lord Jesus, use this situation so that I can pass on the good news. She looked at me and said, Sir, I'm sorry. Her eyes were red, and I replied in English, No harm done. Please, she said, I, I apologize. And then I said, you said that phone was your office. Yes. What do you do for work? I work for a company in China. We make artificial Christ trees. However, after talking back and forth, he realized that she was talking about making artificial Christmas trees. She called them Christ trees. So I asked, uh, um, she said, Europeans and the Christians, because he wanted to make sure, okay, what do you know about what you're making, Christ trees? She said, Europeans and Christians around the world celebrate every year for someone who was born on that day. Then I said, one person is born and the whole world is glad about it? Yes, she said. Next, I wanted to know how many people work at the company. She answered that there were 13,000 employees. 13,000 people make their living in China because one child was born, I asked. Yes, she said. Do you know who this child is? Um, no, I haven't heard much about this person, she said. Finally, I asked, do you want me to hear, excuse me, do you want to hear more about this person who is apparently your company's source of life? She did. I confess to being a Christian and summed up the good news of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the article goes on. Basically, she trusted Christ as Savior that day. Amen. Amazing, amazing opportunity to share the gospel. So very good. All right, God bless you. And we're going to have another song, I do believe. Song number 109. 109. It came upon the midnight clear, 109. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace Thank you. 
Good singing, I thank you for that. It's time for our special music today. And we have invited just about anyone who wants to, to come up and gather around the, the podium here. And we're going to sing Silent Night. So if you would come, uh, I know I invited several other people who said they would come. This is just kind of a, a normally the four ladies of, of New Testament would be doing this, but they've invited us to join them. and. Uh, I thought there'd be a few more coming up here. Marvelous, you told me you'd come. Now, come on, come on. Okay, and you've got your songbooks. You're bringing your songbook. That's good. If anyone else wants to come, you're welcome to, Mike. Okay, I see him shaking his head back there. Okay, I'm going to let you ladies step up to the front here. You are the bosses. You're in charge of this. Okay, yeah. our song is number 111, 111, Silent Night. Pastor, please come. All right, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter number 9, we have an announcement. Let me turn that back on so they can hear you. Christmas 2020 is upon us again, and on behalf of the church body, we want to give you a Christmas gift. We want you to know how much we love and appreciate you and Sherry. Merry Christmas. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you, church family, and I know you do without this, but thank you very, very, very much. We appreciate that, and thank you so, so much. All right. Um, Isaiah chapter number 9, please. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 9. I'm going to read one verse, a very familiar verse to you, I'm sure, and, uh, and then we'll pray. We'll get started this morning. Glad to have everybody in church. Good to have Marvelous back with us. Good to have Netta and her husband here. Glad that they made it safely in. Um, good to have other folks visiting. And uh, some of us uh, are going to be gone for Christmas, so we're still praying for that. 
Rachel's headed out tomorrow. Um, she's flying home to see mommy and daddy. <laughs> so uh, we're glad she's having a chance to go do that. So that's always good, is it not? All right, Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a glorious week this is. Any time that we can stop and as a church open up the Word of God, and Lord, uh, um, we can we can preach and, and we can we can learn from you, Lord, and uh, it's it's a great week. But Lord, in particular, as we stop and consider uh, your birth and Christmas, and, and Lord, what it means to us, and Lord, without Christmas there would be no Easter, and without Easter there would be no salvation, and without that, Lord, we would indeed be most miserable. And so we just thank you, Lord. We ask and pray that you'd help us in our community to try to love folks. Help them to see Christ in our lives and our hearts, Lord, by the way that we live. Lord, often uh, we fail miserably. We acknowledge that. We are not perfect. We need you, and we ask you, Lord, to help us. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to uh, hide us behind the cross. Give us victory, Lord, as we, as we try to live for you. But we ask, God, that uh, even now as we stop for a few moments and we try to honor and glorify you, we pray that we would rightly... Uh, divide the truth. We pray, Lord, that uh, the words that are spoken this morning would honor and glorify Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Other parts of this verse, uh, this is a very familiar verse, and you've heard preaching before. I know um, when it talks about uh, this, the, the government being upon his shoulder, and it talks about the fact that he is wonderful and counselor, and the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We we have heard messages on these before, and, and uh, uh, that is not going to be uh, the title of my message this morning. The topic of my message is, is actually unto us. That's what I want to focus on this morning, unto us. Unto us, this verse says, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. Now, those are two phrases that almost seem to be a needless repetition, Perhaps we think, well, it was just some sort of way for the writer to emphasize what he's trying to say. But might I say very clearly in Scripture that those two thoughts are totally separate. Those two thoughts have two different concepts in mind, and there's a definite distinction in the statements. And as Jesus Christ, he was born as truly as any other man in his humanity, he is a child. And so, unto us, where the Bible says here, a child is born. It's talking about his humanity, the fact that God became man. Um, the fact that, that, that God, who, who, who was above all and created all, became part of his creation. This was a miracle. And then the next phrase, as it talks about the fact that a son is given, that is Jesus Christ now... Um, um, he, it's talking about his being, who, who he is. He is given to us as the Son of God. So this is a solemn mystery that even the angels do not understand. And the Bible says that, that the angels even desire to look into the fact that God was made a little lower than the angels and became man. And so as a child he was born, but as a son he was given to us. No finite creature can understand the infinite. We can't understand the divine. As soon as you think that you can define God and you understand all that there is to know about God and who He is and what He's done for us, as soon as you think you've got Him in a box, it's going to poof away from you, folks. Okay, we do not understand God. We do not know who He is or what He's done. Um, his, his love is boundless, and, and He is the only begotten Son Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us is where the full force of the passage this morning in particular is going to lie. And this morning we're going to consider three thoughts about these words. First of all, is it, is it so? Is it true? Unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born. Is that true? Secondly, if it is true, what then? And then if it is not true, what then? So we're going to take these three aspects this morning. It is a fact that Jesus was born in history. As a matter of fact, there is more historical evidence for the Lord Jesus Christ that, than there is for anybody else in history. 
There is more evidence to prove that, uh, that Jesus lived and died than there is uh, for the Caesars and that there is for uh, many great men in history. Abraham Lincoln and, and George Washington have less written about them than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's more proof that he existed than anyone else. It's also a fact that this same Jesus who was born 100% man was also 100% deity. Now how this all takes place, we understand, God tells us what we need to know, that a virgin uh, became with child of the Holy Ghost. It, it wasn't some weird thing, it was the power of the Holy Ghost that overshadowed her, and she in fact began to carry in a bodily form from her seed the very son of man. The important question then today is, is he born in us? Was he born to us? Have we made room for him in the end of our own heart? Do we have a, a personal interest in this son? I mean, when you stop and consider Christmas, do, are, do you have glad tidings of great joy that just flow through you? Is it because Christ is born or because you're going to get gifts? You're going to get presents. Why is Christmas important to you? Some people I have uh, been most sure of were, were very unsure of their own spirituality. I have known men, and I have been surprised. In private, I have had conversations with with pastors, and sometimes you can read a biography of a preacher of days gone by, and you would become surprised to read that they actually doubted their own salvation. Charles Spurgeon tells of a preacher friend who was a very, very godly man. He mentions his name, Reverend Simon Brown, and he said that Brother Brown was a faithful preacher. He worked hard, and he, and he prayed faithfully, but, but he was very sad. He was very depressed. In Reverend Brown's own words, he said, my soul was hopeless. He, he cried when he preached. He had tears. He was sincere when he prayed. But, but he questioned his whole life, do I love the Lord? Do I really love the Lord more than anything? Now, the best of men are going to question. I also know that the worst of men are going to presume. It's amazing because... The worst of men don't even care about their spirituality. They'll sit there and drink a beer and smoke a cigarette. Sure, I'm saved. Now listen, drinking or not drinking, smoking or not smoking, doesn't get you to heaven, okay? My point is this, that they don't care. Many men do not care. And God says, now listen, this is important. We need to understand this. The, uh, the, the average man is careful. He's going to ask questions. He's going to find answers. The prideful man presumes. The prideful man doesn't care. The prideful man says, you know what? I'll figure it out. And, and, and between now and, and, and when he dies, he sort of lives like a bull in a china shop, just tearing everything up and not really caring. Presumption is a terrible thing. I read a story uh, recently of a couple of uh, elderly sisters. I suspect old maids. It didn't exactly use that term, but that was the impression that I got as I read the story, who lived in northern Maine. They sold their house to a young married couple that were all excited. They were getting married, and so the couple went and looked at the house, and the wife, uh, the, the new wife, was concerned because it looked like it would be hard to heed, and she mentioned that to her husband, and the husband was, you know, oh, it's going to be fine. If these two old gals can live there, we can live there. No problem, no problem. And so they bought the house, and they go into their first fall, and they wake up one morning uh, as it begins to cool off, and there's icicles on the inside of the house. Rather cold. And so this, this, this husband, who, who, who does what most husbands do, uh, just said, okay, well, let's find out. We're obviously doing something wrong. I wonder how they heated this place. And so he called the gals who were still, uh, they, they had moved, and, but he, they knew where they had gone to and got a hold of them and asked the question, how in the world did you, what did you do to keep this house warm in the winter? Oh, the lady said, we went to Florida in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Presumption. Presumption, all right? Sometimes we think we know the answer, and we don't know the answer. We got to be careful. Listen, are you born again or are you not born again? That's the question. I'm not asking you, are you a member of this church or any church? You can be a member of this church and die and go to hell. 
Yeah, everybody should be shaking their head right now, up and down, because being a member of a church does not save you, not being a member of this church. Now, hopefully, Lord willing, we're going to faithfully preach the gospel, but the doctrine that is preached is what's going to save you. The truth that is preached is what's going to save a person, not, not the name of the church that they attend. Has Christ been born to us? Has he been given to us? And the question then is, how do we know? If this child of Bethlehem, this child who, who came in a manger, this, this child who, who was brought into the world with the glories of angels singing, if, if he is born to you, then you have been born again. This child is not born to you unless you have been born to this child, as it were. Not all that will be saved have been saved, at least not yet. But all that are saved have passed from death unto life. If a man says that he is saved or that he has been born again but knows nothing about being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, then he does not know what he's talking about. It's sort of like in Acts chapter number 19 where the men there who had never heard whether there be any Holy Ghost, well, they had to refocus. As a matter of fact, in, that, in Acts chapter 19, those men had been baptized before, but they were actually baptized again because they, they didn't even understand salvation. That man's religion is vain. That man's hope is but an illusion. Only men who have been born again can claim the child of Bethlehem as their own. Unto us, that's those people that are born again. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Well, somebody asks, how can I know if I've been born again or not? All right, now I want to stop for just a second because I want you to listen. This is a very, very good question. How can I know? How can I know? And it's not like a checklist. Did you make the preacher happy? Did you show up at church? You know, are you involved in this ministry or that ministry? It's not like a checklist that you can complete because the Bible is very clear. We are not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. So is there some evidence? Has there, is, is, how can I know that I've been born again? That is a good question. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to answer that question with a question. As a matter of fact, I'm going to answer that question with three questions, all right? Because each and every one of us, in just a moment this morning, we're going to take communion. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And, and every single one of us has to do something when we observe the Lord's Supper, and that is we have to look within ourselves and we have to self, self-determine that our hearts are right. I don't know your heart. I don't know your facts. I don't know your circumstances. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you trusted Christ as Savior or not. It's like the preacher who was frustrated and, and, and upset and had a, had, a, had a rough way to go, and, and, uh, and, and he, was, he was dealing with some issues and problems, and he said, I don't think anybody in our church is saved except me and my wife, and sometimes I doubt if she's saved. <laughs> that's, that's a rough way to go, all right? Well, listen, I don't know. I don't know. But God does. And God will sp- speak to your heart. Has there, first of all, all right? So three questions. How can I know if I've been born again? Three questions. First of all, has there been a change affected within you by the grace of God? Has divine grace changed your heart? I mean, listen, have, 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 has your lifestyle changed? Have you stopped sinning, you know, drinking, shooting, you know, looking at th- things and, 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 and thinking about things that are wrong. Listen, we cannot blame the ghetto. We can't blame the big city. We can't blame the small town. We can't blame the reservation for our sins, okay? It's, it's not the ghetto's um, uh, fault that we have a sin problem. It's not the reservation's fault. It's not that we were born in a small town or a big town. We must be born again. What do you love? Do you love what God loves? Or do you love what you have always loved? Do you now hate the things that you used to love? Are you finding Jesus to be that precious pearl of great price? 
Or would you rather sort of wallow in the muck of the world and the sin and the mire of the world? Do you long for sin in your life or do you long for the holiness of God? Do you long for the bottle or for the Holy Spirit? Have you been renewed within? Salvation doesn't come by, by cleaning up the outside. Salvation comes by the cleansing of the inner man. You can whitewash the gravestone all day long. The body must needs be resurrected from the dead. That is the problem. Is your heart a tomb of death or is it a temple of life? Does Jesus live within you? You may have changed some things on the outside, but if you are not changed on the inside, then this child is not born to you. When it talks about unto you, a child is born. That's the first question. Has there been a change affected within you by divine grace? Another question that you need to answer. What would others say concerning your life? What would others say? Now, right here and there, a lot of people will go, well, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I have my relationship with God. I serve God the way I want to. No, 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 it makes a big difference. And the Bible says it makes a big difference what others think about you. So the question is this, would they testify to an obvious change having taken place in your life? Have you ever gone back to work and everybody said, whoa, what's happened to you? I mean, your, your, your language has changed. You actually have like a smile on your face. Has there been a change? Have you ever been laughed at for your stand for God in the midst of a vain and perverse generation? Or are you still, you know, are your grapes still wild, so to speak? I mean, is sin, alcohol, lasciviousness, fornication, adultery, is all that stuff still funny? The proof of the Christian is in the living. To the lost man, the proof of your salvation is not how you feel, but what you do. And that's not asking too much. James stated as much when he said that he would show his faith by his works. Because the Bible is very clear, man looks on the outward appearance. Everybody's favorite verse is, well, God looks at my heart. Yeah, but man looks at the outward appearance. And the point is not that that's a bad thing. We almost read that as though, well, what does man know? They look at the outward appearance. No, the point there is that is all that man has to look at. Your lifestyle, how you live, your choices, your personality, all of those things are supposed to change. The moment you get saved, God puts in you the Holy Spirit of God, and all of a sudden, there's supposed to be a total difference in the way that you are living. Now, we are not always successful. If you were to live with me for, a, oh, let's give you six hours, <laughs> I fall short because I'm a sinner. I wouldn't impress you. Now God says, listen, there's a change that's supposed to take place. And you need to know that for yourself personally, and others need to give testimony to that fact. Not in order to get you to heaven, but if you want any proof, any evidence, listen, that's what the Bible talks about in Hebrews when it mentions the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what people are seeing. That's what they're uh, experiencing in your life. That, that's evidence that indeed, now we don't need evidence and it's not evidence that saves us. It is faith that saves us. But if you want to, to, to have some confidence that you are a child of God, then God gives us opportunity. He tells us, listen, maybe the way you feel is good enough for you. But the question is, is it good enough for the world? Do they see Christ in you? Performers can put on a good show, but after the performance, <laughs> I've known I have been disappointed more times than not. I have thought so-and-so is a great actor, so-and-so is a great actress, boy, they seem nice, they blah, 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 and all of a sudden it comes to light, something happens publicly, and you go, man. Or you read some, some article about them behind the scenes and how vicious and vile and ugly they really are in person, and you go, whoa. You know, we can put on a good show, in public, somebody can be an angel, but in private, they shake hands with the devil. So, have you been changed on the inside according to your testimony? Have you been changed according to the world's testimony? 
And then one more question. The third question that needs to be asked, have the root principles of your life changed? The way that you are now living, are they new? The old man lives totally to self, but the new man lives to God. The unregenerate man seeks his own pleasure, his own advancement, his own success, but the true child of God seeks those things which are above. When it comes to pruning and pruning the Christian life, listen, God is not just going to saw a limb uh, uh, away. He's not going to saw, saw a limb in, in your life here and there and clean things up. He is going to take an ax to the root. He is going to cut the roots off and he's going to give you a new root, and he's going to put you in new soil. And if you think that you have no reason for that to happen, if you think that, that somehow you're an exception, that you don't need to be born again, it is because you have never seen yourself as God sees you, as a lost sinner that needs to be born again. Spurgeon draws a word picture here that might be helpful. He says... The lost man has his heart where his feet should be. In other words, his feet, his heart is touching the earth. Instead of living above the earth, his heart is touching the earth. And then he goes on to say the lost man, so the lost man has his heart where his feet should be and his feet where his heart should be. Because when God tries to enter his heart, he is kicking and struggling did you ever pick up a kid that was angry, try to deal with a child that was upset, and they're kicking and struggling and, and fighting and fussing? Now, you're not going to let them get the best of you, I hope, but that's exactly what we do. And he says that's what a lost man, his, his feet and his heart are reversed. His heart is next to the world, and his feet is kicking away God. How are you living? What is the root, the principles of your life? Have they changed? Is it so? Are you a child of God? So if so, what then? All right, if so. If you are a child of God, all right, where does that take us? Are you the healthy child that's growing into adulthood? The adulthood that you were predestinated, there's that word, three weeks in a row we've used that word. Man, Ron used it this morning, talked about election, read it out right out of the Bible, man. That word's, that, that word's a, right in the Bible, all right? Growing into adulthood, listen, God has predestinated you to be like him. Christ was called a child even after his ascent into heaven. Twice in the book of Acts, he is called the holy child Jesus. Do you take God's word as it is given simply because your heavenly father says so? I would believe my dad, anything my dad said. If my dad was kidding with us, he would be very, very careful to make sure that before the conversation was done, we understood that he was kidding about something. Very, very quickly. Almost as soon as he said it, you could watch his face and his expression, and he would make sure that us kids understood that it was just a joke. Because we believed everything our dad said. And that's why we believed everything our dad said. I mean, we, 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 our, our mom and dad taught us what Santa Claus was, a fake from day one. We didn't have the issues. You know how many kids are like distraught? You know? I mean, my wife believed in Santa Claus until we got married. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it destroyed her emotionally. No, no, no. I did that. I did that. We need to be honest. Do you believe the mysteries of Scripture without needing them to be explained? You know, there are just some... I don't know. The Bible says some things, and you go, how? How can I be saved? How can I be born again? How can I know for sure that my sin is forgiven? How is that even possible? Do you sit excitedly as a child in the classroom waiting to learn at the feet of your master? Man, it was great this morning. The kids come in for Sunday school, and they're, going, they're flying back to their Sunday school class. They love their teachers. Do you desire the sincere milk of the word, even if it's contrary to reason? Except you are converted, the Bible says, and become as little children, then this child of Bethlehem is not born to you. And so my question is this, are, are you humble, teachable, 
obedient, pleased only with your Father's will. I can't believe sometimes how closely Sunday school and the main service kind of link together. But it is a glorious sight as a pastor when you see somebody who is, who is an adult come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And, and, and maybe he was an infidel, maybe he was obvious, maybe, he, maybe not, but anyway, he was somebody that used to reason against Christ and didn't care much about the church and didn't care much about God necessarily, other than he was just sort of peripheral and, yeah, I probably ought to acknowledge him just in case sort of thing. And then when they get saved, all of a sudden, everything changes. And, and uh, all of a sudden, um, uh, at, at that moment, he trusts Christ. It's amazing because at that point, he doesn't care where Cain got his wife. It doesn't matter because he was born again. At that moment, he becomes happy, and all of a sudden, the lowliest place in the church, it's like, I wonder, Pastor, and this might be somebody who is capable of accomplishing so much, and his attitude is, maybe I can just come and help clean, or, or maybe I could just come and, 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 and help cut the grass, or, or can I do anything for God? But when you see that attitude change in a person, that's, that's a privilege. That's, a, that's something that excites the heart of a preacher. The newborn Christian doesn't want to teach. He wants to sit and learn and, and soak it all up. And when he's asked to, to teach, he's almost afraid to open his mouth because he, he doesn't know anything other than he's saved. And, and we can encourage him and say, well, that's all you need to know. But that spirit is, is what we like. That's because pride causes us to want to teach and, and, and to want to prove and to want to force that our favorite doctrines fit the Bible. There are so many people who claim to be saved, but what they're doing is going back to what they used to believe and trying to force this thing into Scripture. If we can make what we used to believe fit, then that is proof that we weren't that far off with to begin with. That, that's what that heart says. Man, if I can prove, and there are so many people living this way in the world, if I can prove, listen, they, they argue, well, people say that we're not Christians. And so they try to take their doctrine and fit it in the Bible. And if they can do that, well, then they conclude, well, see, we're just not that far off to begin with. But the truth of the matter is, we are that far off to begin with. Every single one of us is a sinner. Every single one of us. Once a person gets born again, they should not, not be trying to bring all of their old doctrines or what they used to believe as kids or growing up in church. They, they, they should not be bringing all of those things and trying to force them to fit the, the Bible. They need to let go and, and let the Bible teach us what is truth and what is not. That is the only way that we're going to grow spiritually. You must be born again. If you are not born again, then this child is not born in you. And so let's consider the, uh, again, if, if, if so, what then question in light of the second statement in uh, Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse number 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. All right, considering that, if you are a child of God, then unto you a son has been given. Because if this son has been given to you, it is because you are a son yourself. The Bible says in John chapter number one, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So whereas the Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, the very begotten, the only begotten son of God, you and I are adopted sons of God, sons and daughters of God. So I cannot enjoy the only begotten son of God unless I am an adopted son. That's what the Bible teaches. Do you have such a child's love for your heavenly father? I mean, do you love him so much that when you disappoint him, it hurts? Do you trust him as provider and friend? Do you naturally carry the spirit of adoption, whereby indeed you cry, Abba, Father? On your knees, can you honestly cry out for your father and your God? Does your spirit bear witness with his spirit that you are his child? 
If the Son has been given to us, we have been given to the Son. But listen, if this is not so, if these things are not so, do not deceive yourself. You are not a child of God. Is God's glory and honor the one thing that you live for? Is it so? If so, if all those things are so, what does that mean? Well, listen, Christian, why would you be doubtful? If it is so, unto us, unto us, it says, a child is born, unto us, emphasizing that. If that is so, listen, why are you doubting? Don't question. Doesn't the word of God exhort us to make our calling and election sure? I mean, if the Son of God has been given to you, why should you not know it? In other words, why the sad face? Why the discouragement? Why not rejoice with, with the celestial host and choir of heaven? A child is born, and that child is born in your heart. What, what does it matter, your circumstances? What does it matter, your health? What does it matter, your finances? And really, as wicked and as deceitful and as nasty as your sin might be, what does it matter? Because God has forgiven you of all of it. We're not going to give an account of our sin. Christ took our sin upon him when he died on the cross of Calvary. You have a son. You have a son. What does it matter? The son of God lives in your heart. This Christmas, you have the very best gift that you can give to your Savior. You can give yourself back to him. He has given himself to you. If so, what then? All right, if not so, what then? And we're about done. If so, excuse me, if it is not so, what then? Well, if, if you are not a child of God, then you are of all men most miserable, wretched. You're not a child. You don't have a child. Unto you is, is not given a child. Uh, unto you a child is not born, unto you a son is not given, you have no hope. One day, the Bible is very clear, you will desire just a drop of water, just a drop of water to be put on your tongue, and it won't happen. If you are not a child of God, one day you'll be separated from God forever and ever in a place called hell. Dying every moment, but never finish dying. Confess your sin. Oh, praise God, not to me. <laughs> Don't tell me. Okay, I got enough of my own issues, okay? All right, you know who you, you need to confess your sin to? God. All alone. You don't have to tell anybody. Oh, I realize if you've offended somebody, you're supposed to go to them. We're talking about... We're talking about salvation. We're talking about what do you need to do to get saved? You go to God, God who already knows all about you, God who knows more of your sin. He, he knows stuff that you have forgotten. As wicked as your heart is, as wicked as my heart is, God, as, as, as distraught as I get just because of some of my memories, and I go, oh, how could I have ever said that? How could I have ever had that? How could I have ever let that come through my, my, my lips? How could I have ever... Oh, and I kill myself because I've hurt people, and I know that at that point I was a I, I claimed to be a Christian, but I sure wasn't acting like it. And I and I question, even like we read, we talked about earlier, how we 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 question, are we even saved? How can somebody do that? Well, all you have to do is confess your sin to God because He knows all that stuff and much more not to me, not in my ear, praise the Lord, to God. Listen, if a child of God cannot live righteously, there's no way that you can do that either without Christ. If a ship without a rudder can't steer itself, then how in the world can, can just a poor stick of lumber like you and me get anywhere? 
we're floating on the waves and subject solely to, to the will uh, of the waves. We have to sit at the foot of the cross and trust in the strength and the righteousness of the Lamb. Completely. In the Lamb that was slain to save you and to sustain you. And that's what salvation is all about. We can't talk about Christmas without talking about Easter. We really don't talk about Easter much without being reminded of Christmas because those two events are vitally connected. God became man. How can God die? God can't die. God is like, like God. That's what makes him God. He doesn't die. But God became man. And as man, he did die. And he died because he took sin and he took all of your sin and he took all of my sin. And you go, well, well, I got saved and I keep sinning and, I, and my sin, he, he, and, and is, he, is all my sin paid for? Let me encourage you folks, when, you di- when Christ died on the cross, all of your sin was in the future. And he paid it all. Yeah, I know, I can, I can be silly and I can be goofy. And so can you. We can we can say things, we can disappoint ourselves, and we can disappoint our Savior. But He loves us. If you're here this morning, you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, His personal Savior. We're talking about knowing for sure that your sins are forgiven. Oh, give us the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you, taking the Bible and showing you how you can know for sure that you're a child of God. What a privilege that would be, oh, for us to know that. For us to be aware that we are on our way to heaven. It has nothing to do. Aren't you glad? You know what? If, if, if our salvation rested in a church, then, then, then if, if the church doctrine changed, then, then all of a sudden we'd start doubting our salvation. If, you're, if, if you think that your salvation is rests upon me and my life, what if I disappoint you? It's got to rest on the solid rock. It's got to rest on Christ. Unto you, unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. Has that happened? Do you own him? Can you witness in your heart, can you say, you know what, yeah, I've, I messed up. I got a few habits I got to fix up. Okay, listen, you can have some bad habits and be saved. But does it bother you? If it bothers you, that's a good thing. If it doesn't bother you, that's not so good. Not so good at all. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're here this morning. We've opened up the Word of God. Lord, uh, we've, we've, we've spoken a message dealing with the fact that you came to save sinners. And Heavenly Father, if we're not willing to acknowledge the fact that we're a sinner, then to be perfectly honest, you will have none of us. There, there's no hope for us. Lord, uh, if, if we've come to, to this place in order to argue why we deserve heaven, Lord, then we've come to the wrong place. Because this place is not where we come to argue why we deserve it, but rather where we come and we shut our mouths and acknowledge that we do not deserve it. And we ask you to forgive us. We confess our sin. We acknowledge the fact that we cannot save ourselves. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would Continue to do a work in hearts and lives. May the work that you have started, Lord, continue to your honor and to your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.